Welcome to Day 2 Cloud, you amazing human. I'm Ned Bellabance. With me is Ethan Banks. And today we have a very special guest, Marino Weije. He is an open source community advocate, and he has some thoughts on cloud repatriation, what it means to be the source of truth, and building a common lowest denominator when it comes to platforms. Right, Ethan? <laughs> uh, lowest common denominator. Yeah, we talked about that. We also got into what it actually looks like if you are repatriating and you want to bring the cloud practice that you enjoyed in one of the big three. How do you do that on premises? Because it's not a straightforward thing. And then we actually got into yet another discussion of, well, what if I just did a lift and shift? Can I just go <laughs> back to the way it was, Ned? No, you can't. And you'll find out why with this conversation with Marina Weje. Well, Marina, welcome to Day 2 Cloud. We're very excited to have you here. And you have some opinions on cloud repatriation. But before we get into those, why don't you tell the good listeners a little bit about yourself and what you do? Thank you so much, Ned, and thank you for having me on the show. My name is Marina Widje, and I'm an open source advocate with a strong emphasis on the OSI and networking. I spent a lot of time in networking, and I've seen different patterns make its way into other domains like cloud and then cloud native. And you start to see abstractions and systems built. And then you start to think, hey, didn't we already build this once before? <laughs> so uh, I, that's what I do. I spend a lot of time in the community really working with folks, enabling them on networking technologies from the past and how a lot of that has impacted what goes on today across a variety of styles of workloads, solving different kinds of problems with network technologies. And that's me. I'm a Canadian too, by the way. Excellent. Well, well, we'll allow the last one. That seems like that's okay. <laughs> but for the rest of it, I mean, it's been interesting to watch the OSI layer being taught and then immediately people caveating. And so going, you know, it's really just yeah. three layers or it's really just four layers, but we had seven. So we got to talk about the full seven. And <sighs> I think that's a testament to how technologies emerge over time. We start with these mental models that make sense for a certain era and we can transmogrify that mental model as things evolve and one of the things that has been evolving is where do i place my workloads or where do i move them so you had brought up the topic of cloud repatriation before we started recording i'm curious what your thoughts are and what does it mean to repatriate a workload or an application to repatriate a workload or application is to really assess its validity in a place where it doesn't need to be and in a place where it needs to be. So when you start to think about workloads and their predictability, if you can predict how much resources they consume, how much time on the network they consume, then you could basically predict how much resources you need to allocate for that for a sustained period of time. In other situations, however, you may not have that level of control or visibility, and you have these kinds of workloads workloads doing very bursty things. Now, repatriation really comes back down to is where can I take my workloads to make my operations much more cost efficient, right? Where can I run these workloads in a very efficient manner that achieves sustainability goals, that reduces my overall operational operational expenditures, uh, but also doesn't have to create additional complexity for me or I have to go learn something new. So let's think about what happened. We went to the cloud and now people use the cloud. And then you have organizations that have decided, hey, I'm, I'm walking away from the cloud and I'm going to build everything on premises. Now, the one biggest key difference is that we've learned so much using the cloud operating in that model. And because we operated in that model for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. We now have this facility to say, look, we, we have some learnings. We have a lot of data. We have a lot of predictability. We know how these models can operate. Let's build this back on premises. But we'll learn from some of our mistakes that we made many, 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 many years ago. Ideally, we'll learn from those mistakes. So hopefully someone wrote them down somewhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Now you say shouldn't introduce complexity for me. Well, who is me? Because if I'm an operator and you just asked me to build a private cloud, my life just got, well, depending on your point of view, but my life just got more complicated. My life did get complicated in some ways, right? And it really comes down to the fact of how I've built back or how I've built supportability of what I'm trying to do. 
So if I'm trying to achieve, you know, a one-to-one mapping of what I did in the cloud, but on premises or in the edge or in maybe a co-located environment, what what is that additional gap that I have to fill before I can achieve that same level of capability? Is that gap within my wheelhouse? Can I outsource that gap to another environment or team or consultants that can handle this, create that bridge, and then still allow me to operate as if I'm operating in the cloud, but not have to pay so much. So there's a lot of different ways that that I can look at that, right? But it also needs to be a model that is consumable for everyone. I don't want to build a proprietary model where, okay, I can only bring this back on premises and that's the end of it. And all, only I can do it. Now, if we look the other way, right? If we look at all the efforts that were made to bring workloads into the cloud, migration strategies, tools like WAN optimizers, let's uh, replicate our data, our LUNs all the way to the cloud, and then just like attach them to the servers and then pop them online and boom, now our VMs are online, right? It, it's not that simple, but that that would be the ideal scenario maybe 10 15 years ago, like if I could just do that. Today, it's a lot more complex because we're not just talking about a virtual machine that's going from cloud to data center or data center to cloud. We're talking about a virtual machine that communicates with a microservice that has to talk to an identity provider that has to get issued a token and so many different moving pieces in between, something else that has to validate and to test workloads that that model isn't easy to just bring back on premises, right? So the repatriation that I have in mind is is a model where you've decided there are certain types of workloads that do best in the cloud. There are certain types of workloads that do best at the edge. There are certain types of workloads that do best on premises or in our within our control. And so we have to sit there and decide and strategize according to that. So, so in that context of what you just said. Edge uh, was also part of it, and and Colo I think came up, and so on. So when we're talking repatriation, I usually think of I'm hosting some kind of a workload in the big three, and I'm bringing it back to on premises, my own data center. But could it also mean I'm repatriating to a Colo or to the Edge? Absolutely, and I think it's primarily due to the fact that it's going to depend on the workload. Some workloads may be better fit to the edge style because of things like content delivery requirements, access to lower latency. Uh, you know, let's think we're, you know, serving up an S3 like functionality or something for our own business. I think it only makes sense if we place those kinds of uh, sources of data at the edge closer to where it's going to be accessed. Now, on the other hand, right, co-located, co-located environments mean what what's the minimal amount of work I need to do uh, to to still have some level of control, but also control costs, but also not have to worry about procurement. You know, if I talk to the data center, they'll give me what I need. And all I need is just, you know, access to the bare metal bits. Right. All you need is money. <laughs> that too, right? You need money and someone to run around and pop in and pop out drives when you need to. <laughs> Well, that was part of the promise of the cloud was you were getting away from that physically having to interact with the servers and do the day-to-day replacing of power supplies and bad hard drives and all that. And they would do all the racking, stacking, and wiring for you. And then add a whole bunch of services on top of that. Co-location rolls some of that back and says, we'll provide the first portion of that. But then the as-a-service portion is really up to you to build out on your own. So... One of the models, that co-location model, was one that was championed by DHH and his very public migration off of, I think it was a combination of AWS and GCP. Do you think that that is a significant trend that's going to, that is happening right now? Or is this something that's coming in a few years? If I look at the cloud numbers, it seems like the public clouds are are, are still growing. I think that overall, we have workloads that are growing. We're not reducing the amount of workloads that we run. So there's there's another side to this too. So what DHH shared with us, right? If there's a Twitter space about this too, is that there was a model that he was already very, very familiar with on premises, right? He knew it, predictability. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, you stand this up, you set this up. I know what it's going to do. I know what I need to do to it to make it work. 
but you know, because I can't scale quickly enough, I'm going to use the cloud. But because of the cost pressures, the economic pressures we've seen from different ends, now I, I, we don't know the full story, right? Of all the different kinds of workloads that he's decided he's going to bring back on premises and manage through Dell hardware, because he's called out the fact that he's using Dell hardware. He's stacking up his virtualization stacks and however the heck he's running his workloads, he's running them uh, in a cost-efficient, predictable manner. Uh, now, is that for everyone? Probably not. It's going to make some organizations think very carefully about where they decide they want to move some of their workloads in the future. Should we expand our existing data center? And here's the other thing that's going to happen. Now that decision-making is going to just increase the lead time overall before you can even get to the cloud or before you can even launch an app. And by then, you have diminished value because that time wasted deciding whether or not you're going to do this or that means, okay, well, you probably just saved what or negated what you have saved if you used the cloud anyways, right? right. Now, having said that, like DHH is an extreme case and uh, in the sense of like he's very influential. So you have a lot of, he says a lot of things about what he would do and a lot of people would feel like it's probably the right thing to do. And that's why I said, like, when you think about the kinds of workloads you run, it's not always going to be perfect for on-premises, right? Think about your SLOs and your SLAs. Can you really get to what the clouds provide you in terms of the SLOs and SLAs that are out there? Maybe, maybe close, but not truly all the way there, right? right? Yeah. And so you, you map that to your business and then your insurance and your loss of revenue and all these different factors. And someone that's doing the fancy accounting realizes it's probably better that we just do this in the cloud. But still, there's a repatriation movement or there, there seems to be. There's this sense of it. Is cost the only driver here um, or, or is it just the biggest driver? Cost is a driver because it becomes apparent how much wastage there is. If someone spins up an EC2 instance, are they going to be running it at 100% capacity at all the time, all times? Probably not. They'll spin it up, let it sit there, do something to it. Um, it's reserved as an instance. So now you're just paying for you know, CPU and memory that you're not really consuming. Who else is consuming it? No one gets to. So it's just burned away. And when you really start to think about it, it's really down to the kinds of workloads you would want to run where. But here's the other thing too. Remember this whole movement around Kubernetes? Like, oh, everyone's got to run Kubernetes. Everyone's got to microservice everything. Everyone's got to run containers. So, you know, there was. it's still going on because there's still a movement, but there's a lot of money burned in just the whole decision of how do we microservice this whole monolith. And then people are starting to begin to realize we could have just left it a monolith to begin with. Some mm -hmm. people even call this out. There are some services that just need to stay as such because they just operate better in a very closed, tight ecosystem where there's IPC between different services, and that's about it. But then when we start to think about other kinds of services that are stateless, that need to scale, maybe they're better suited for Kubernetes because Kubernetes itself was primarily built to, to manage stateless workloads, to run stateless workloads and offer up APIs yep. to interact with stateless workloads. <laughs> and then someone decided, hey, let's take a database in here and uh, take, yeah, anyways, let's not go there right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the world of stateless databases, still not a thing. You need to have that state reside somewhere. I had a very long conversation with, uh, with a friend of the show uh, about what does it mean to be ephemeral and stateless and how can you do truly immutable infrastructure? And what we came down to is the state's got to be stored somewhere, right? It, you can't, it's just not, it's not infinite shell, uh, it's not a shell game. It's not infinite turtles all the way down. Like somewhere you actually have to store some state, whether that's in Kubernetes or somewhere else. And I think to, to condense down the conversation about databases on Kubernetes, I think that's what it all comes down to is state's got to live somewhere. Exactly. I mean, there are system solutions and tools and even people that specialize in this stuff. Just not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've identified some prevailing reasons why people might be moving their workloads back on premises or to a co-location facility. But like you said, there's some lessons we learned. Like we're, we're not coming at this and going, well, we're just going, we're hitting the backup tapes and just rewinding to 2005 when VMware was fresh and new and all was well with the world. 
we we want to roll forward with some of our progress. What are some of the lessons we've learned that you sort of alluded to when it comes to operations? I think the largest lesson is that version control is a, a an important source of documentation. I think starting everything from the lens of version control using Git, for example, mm-hmm. is going to going to drastically change the way you approach your infrastructure on premises because now you can inject things like bare metal provisioning and feed it into your whole CI CD process. You can you can now provision uh, networks pretty easily in code. You can provision your application stacks, Kubernetes, non-Kubernetes, everything in code, right? But a lot of it will fall back to your version control and what you put into it, how you want your infrastructure and your application architecture to look like. We'll all live there, right? And that's one of the biggest learnings. The next biggest learning is we've we've invested so much time in building out and seeing through these observability tools, like through tracing, logging, monitoring. And a lot of that, while it was really hot, you know, back when we were working on premises, it became hotter when we got into the cloud because of cost optimization, because we wanted to prevent failures. We wanted to achieve high, higher levels of availability. And that same theme, because it's now not cloud centric anymore, comes back on premises. So now we have observability, right? We have automation. We have this infrastructure as code, uh, things we've been doing before, but now because we've done so much of it in the cloud, it becomes natural, right? And mm-hmm. the only thing we really have to care about at this point is the consistency in our hardware, uh, the availability of it, and how quickly we can get access to it and our circuits. So the biggest shift we're talking about here is like twofold, I would say. One is the whole GitOps movement where the source of truth is the code and that's how that's what kicks off workflows that's where you can go to figure out what changed and who changed it that's one portion of the conversation the other portion is there are now apis in front of almost everything that we consume and so we can actually use code to configure those things whereas before the best you could do was ssh into something or you know rely on ansible perhaps to do the automation for you is that uh, an accurate summary is there what would you add to that i think apis are lovely they've given us so much capability and flexibility it's not the be all end all but i think it sets us on a path forward for being able to decide hey i want to define what my everything looks like and i can still communicate with api endpoints and it'll get translated to the way it should look but that's that's it i just i need an endpoint, a rest endpoint that I can communicate with. And that's been going on forever. Like, Mm -hmm. let's be real. We've been doing this for, oh my gosh, it's 2024. We've been doing this for (laughs) probably a decade now. Uh, Well over a decade. Yeah, Yeah. well over a decade. Now, the the surprise here is that what, what really needs to happen and what people are asking for is, I want a cloud-like platform, keyword platform back on premises. Mm -hmm. And I need two sides to that platform, one for developers and one for platform teams. So what's interesting is companies like Red Hat and VMware have built this before. They've they've developed these technologies, like for example, Tanzu is an Mm -hmm. example of this. OpenShift is another example of this. And then they leverage the hooks underneath for their hypervisors or their respective hypervisor engines. And so when you start to think about this for a second, Okay, they've been already putting in all this work to, and effort to get here. What what needs to be different? What needs to be? What's the one thing that we need to consider here if we want to achieve that like cloud, like platform, but on premises? What it is is consistency, hmm. consistency of what our workloads are going to look like, and I think that's where we're going to miss a lot. Right? We assume way too much. We assume that sure, if we could do it in the cloud, we could do it on premise. But we can't. We actually can't. And it has a lot to do with the economies of scale that these cloud providers have the access to that a lot of organizations don't. Even if we decided we wanted to use colos, even if we decided we wanted to use a mix of colos and edge compute and our our own on-premises offerings. The reality is that there's so much glue that needs to go into this. You're you're gonna spend more yeah. time, more money on consultants and engineers really trying to build out your platform 
when at the end of the yeah. day, you could have just left it in the cloud, right? And this is what Whereas it's going to be. AWS and, and, and Azure and the rest, they have a very controlled environment that's very specific to them. They control everything from the, the, the switches, the servers. In some cases, they have custom silicon. That's their own. And so that glue is that they've layered on that we don't have to deal with is over a very controlled environment, a very specific thing that uh, that they have created over the years that make them maximally efficient and uh, and so on. We don't have that if we're building it ourselves. We have <laughs> some of that. There's elements we can take control of and try to do a similar kind of thing and create that controlled environment. Single vendor, you have to buy off the approved list of hardware that we've decided are going to be good for our environment and so on. And you can live within those constraints. But they don't always, you also don't have all the institutional knowledge that those uh, cloud providers have built up uh, about how to build those sources. Like you were saying earlier, Marino, can you really stand up a data center that's going to have the same kind of uptime that AWS, Azure, and the rest are going to have? Mm, you know, maybe on your best day with the right kind of engineers and uh, access to the right sort of power grids and all the rest, you could you could get close. So are you going to do it as well as them? Probably not. Never mind, is the application that you're building well-constructed and designed such that it could leverage that infrastructure, even if you had it. Yet another shortcoming that we find, it isn't the cloud, it's the app running on the cloud that's actually the problem. Uh, and our downtime is not a result of the platform, it's a result of the application. I'm getting all excited, sorry, Marino, but <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you okay. just hit, hit on something I think that is important. Uh, Ned, before we go on to the next question in the script, man, you had a note here of a question you wanted to ask that I'm dying to hear you ask, Marino, because it's such oh, a can God. of Oh, God, yeah, no... So we talked about GitOps and how, in theory, your what's in source control should be the source of truth. That should be how things actually are. But we know drift happens. And the question comes down to, should source control be the source of truth? Or should we have that stored somewhere else? Or can there be a single source of truth at all? I think... It's a very difficult question to answer because there are multiple factors at play, especially when it comes to that source of truth. The source of truth will always be the team that sits there and decides how these features are going to look, right? That's them. That's that whiteboard. They sat there and they drew off and decide <laughs> this is this service that has this dependency on that and requires this and all these extra little bits and pieces. Now, the reality is like who actually takes a picture of that whiteboard and then turns it into a real diagram. Sometimes it happens. I mean, it probably should happen more frequently than not. That is that single source of truth. But then over time, that idea even drifts, right? What was that game we used to play when we were kids? Broken telephone or something like that. It was just called telephone, telephone game or yeah. whisper yeah, down right. the lane. Yeah. 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 Right. And you would start with one message. And then by the time you got that message, it was like way off than what you said, right? And that can happen even in communications amongst engineers. So, you know, there's going to be verification amongst them. They're going to agree upon the fact that, hey, we want this idea. Let's put it in Git. It's going to stay in Git. We're going to constantly check on it. And there's always going to be a team of maintainers and contributors that look at that and say, this is how we want it to look consistently. And if anything needs to deviate, right, well, here's how we handle that deviation. And those deviations are usually handled through the fact of let's let's discuss this issue or let's discuss this pull request, for example, and why you're trying to deviate. What value does it add to the base code? What is it trying to do? What are we trying to fix here? There's a lot of different considerations that go on here. And that that drift can be controlled through governance, hmm. through team governance, right? If you have the right folks that own a project, own a feature, and this is all software development, if you own, own all of these different aspects of your of your code then that drift becomes less likely altogether and so that applies for infrastructure as well someone's gonna have to own that or a team is gonna have to own that i think another interesting thing to consider is the time to coalesce between different sources of truth because when i commit to a particular branch that kicks off a workflow that workflow could take 15 minutes it could take two hours at the same time a dependent application could have a commit that also takes two hours. So it's not until at least two or three hours after both commits have happened and the workflows have run that my source of truth has coalesced to the actual architecture that we're running on. And we get to see if anything broke 
when those two changes merged with each other. I mean, that's definitely happened in production before. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's that's a reality, too, because there are so many interdependencies of how your application runs and tests itself. And if it doesn't hit that same threshold or timer, then, yes, you might run into that kind of situation of a drift. Uh, but then in those conditions, uh, I think at that point, there are going to be alerts going off and someone's going to catch it and they're going to yeah. find ways to roll back and figure out where the problem is and find ways to get around that. And I think we've learned specifically from those mistakes in itself, like using Git branching and Git branching strategies altogether and how to improve upon, you know, not stepping on each other's toes when you're developing and, and pushing out new features or, or changes. We could probably go on this source of truth thing for like the next hour, but I do want to shift the conversation back to the idea of a cloud operating model on premises. And Ethan, I, I want to like highlight what you said about how most people are not running. Well, oh, nobody's running at the hyperscalers scale except for the hyperscalers. But yeah. for anybody who's like a medium sized business, the idea of the overhead you have to assume for running a complex control plane and platform is huge. And I think people who are eyeing up the cloud repatriation game don't necessarily recognize how big of a lift that is, especially if they don't have a dedicated platform team. So Marino, I guess my question to you is, do you think in order to be successful in this, you need to put together a platform team and, and select a platform that is not as high maintenance as some of the older ones? This is going to be a very interesting uh, perspective, but I don't think people should be building their platforms or even building teams to build platforms. Mm -hmm. There are platforms that have been built before. <laughs> and I think it's literally a matter of, you know, hire a few individuals that will sit there and assess your business and technical requirements, align those to what platforms exist today in the market and that offer the extensibility for where you might try to go with your business and some of your applications and then buy that platform, which will be cheaper. Okay, okay. Than... Buy, buy the platform. So in other words, cloud in a box, there, there's a cloud in a box out there. I can buy, just commit to that platform and, and, and go, whether that's, yeah. it could be something Kubernetes based, like an open ship, something like that, or maybe something, uh, VMware, okay. Broadware, whatever we're calling them now is, uh, <laughs> it, it, it can give be, me something it, like that. Tanzu com or whatever you want to call it, but uh, it, it could be something like Tanzu. It could be something like um, Rancher, OpenShift, uh, sorry, not OpenShift, Rancher, SUSE, and it's Harvester, HCI system. Uh, it could be Red, Red Hat, OpenShift for that matter. It could be going back to the cloud. It could be just deploying EC2 instances, Google Cloud instances, SIBO Cloud instances all over the place, and then rolling your own Kubernetes and doing Kubert under the hood and then doing mm. something Frankenstein if you want. I mean, <laughs> there's there's a lot of different ways that you could really think of the platform. A lot of folks have invested a, a ton of effort into building out GitOps and even like with technologies like Flux and Argo. And through that, they've kind of built a platform, right? They've built a, a mm. platform that handles storage, networking, compute, and then the application on top of it, and then the scale the observability, uh, the certificate management and identity management, all the necessary pieces to make this work. So it's, uh, it's rather interesting, I will say, that you can actually take an existing platform, open source or proprietary or enterprise-y, or you could build your own. But I honestly recommend people just like go gravitate to the stuff that's already been around for a long time. <laughs> you don't, know, don't build it, it yourself. Yeah. Don't build it yourself. You know, trust the ones that have tried it already and have been doing it for years. Like, yeah, I, I can understand that there's some uncertainty right now with Broadcom and VMware and using that technology. But the reality is like there is there, there's a ton invested in the usage of vSphere and Tanzu alone and some of the extended technologies. And I don't think a company like Broadcom is just going to walk away from all of that. Not that quickly. I would imagine they probably try to build them a path to get them elsewhere or, or try to like limit the overall function of what VMware used to offer, right? And limit it to things like just the core ESX and and maybe NSX and vSAN on maybe a NIC, a smart NIC or something equivalent mm -hmm. or, or a DPU for that matter. But the reality is, um, you know, things do have to change at some point and your workloads will have to morph or, or find a new location 
uh, that doesn't mean all of what you've invested in from a skill set standpoint is gone. It just disappears because I, I've been testing out like Harvester in my home lab, where the same home lab used to run vSphere, Tanzu actually. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of similarities, uh, but the differences are like, okay, now I'm using a Kubernetes API approach to managing my HCI environment, which is kind of cool, but also also interesting and strange because you're also running into like some caveats that you normally wouldn't. But in any case, I, uh, I, I honestly think that um, the way of the HCI will come back again. Companies like Nutanix will uh mm. will be like yeah let's sell hci all over again and i don't know what their i <laughs> can't remember what their uh hyperconverged system was um it's been a while i don't know i did their nc or their nutanix professional certification like probably 10 years ago i don't know yeah <laughs> it's been a while it's been well, a while it, it, to me the argument in favor of a platform is um people have done this before but then from a business perspective I don't want to roll my own Frankensteinian thing, as you mentioned earlier, because then I'm kind of married to the engineers that built the thing. And when they inevitably leave to do something else, I'm stuck with this thing they built. Can we still use it? Can we still operate it? Can we still make updates to it as we need to? A lot of times the answer is not really. And you end up having to migrate to some other platform. Now, if you buy into a vendor platform, they're doing the development work for it. And you just need an engineer that knows how to operate that platform. That's a way easier position to try to fill than I need someone who knows how to code and who understands automation and who knows infrastructure, networking and security pretty thoroughly. You've got a good DevOps background. Yeah, good luck finding the unicorn. But I need someone that knows Tanzu. I need someone that knows OpenShift. Okay, that's a bit easier. Or it's at least easier to train them on, even if they don't know it, if they've got the right background. So filling that gap as people move around is much easier for you as a business. I, I view it as a lower risk for the average business. It is it is significantly lower of a risk. Yes, you lose flexibility and customizability, but the reality is you're you're given a platform that has been tested patched you know has all the capabilities you need and then some and maybe you just need to reframe your thinking I, it sounds weird because okay now i have to reshape my app to fit the platform i'm running on not necessarily but yeah. it's more like working around some of these constraints and rethinking how you should really build your app with what tools you have in front of you because now your other option is okay if i decide i'm going to scrap everything that's vsphere or openshift or openstack and build it myself, well, for that one little thing I need that I couldn't architect around, well, I'm going to spend this much of time and money to build it. So, and a lot of people, a lot of organizations don't think of that sometimes. I've seen it happen before. I've worked in organizations like that before. So it's funny that, because I feel like I had the same conversation in reverse when we talked about migrating to the cloud. And people would come up with these cost calculators and it was like a TCO calculator. So it's supposed to take into account all the costs you were going to save on if you move to the cloud. And most of the calculators were built by the cloud providers. So obviously they tilted in a particular direction. But a lot of the same considerations are still there when you're thinking about moving back, something back on premise. Okay, all those things that I was going to save money on by no longer having to do now I have to do those things. So where do I draw the line? What do I want as a service that someone else is responsible for? And what portions do I want my team to be responsible for? We drew that line somewhere when it came to consuming cloud. Now we have to redraw that line, but still have a bare minimum. I think so too. I think we, we do need a bare minimum. I think we need we need a common denominator. Yes, that's that's what I was trying to get as there still needs to be some common denominator across my workloads. And since I'm probably not going to migrate everything from one to the other, I need a common denominator that is the same across the public clouds I'm consuming, the edge locations I'm consuming, and my on-premises or branch offices or colo, wherever else our workloads end up. I don't know what that common denominator is. Is it Kubernetes? I don't know. So it's, I've had this conversation, I think a year ago, I had, I've had this conversation several times too. And it, okay. So 
let's take vSphere, right? vSphere was an excellent hypervisor that you could take to the cloud. In fact, VMware even did it. They did a VMC on AWS, VMC on Google. They they did VMC wherever they could shove VMC. And... (laughs) But when you think about that, it is, let's take this entire stack and stick it somewhere where we know it can run. Can you stick VMC at the edge? If you give it a three node nut cluster that had max 192 uh, gigs of RAM, maybe, but you're like, you've got no real estate for workloads and no real estate for failure, no real estate for tolerance of like a a node loss or something along those lines, right? Mm -hmm. So vSphere is not the common denominator there anymore. Okay, let's try this with Docker. Okay, Docker, sure, we have a portable workload style that we can move around, but we'll need something like uh, Docker, I don't know, what what is it? Not Swarm. Is it Docker Swarm? That allows me to manage. Yeah. Let me manage all of these container environments at scale. But then there's still other issues like networking and, you know, making sure that you're pulling your containers from the right locations. Okay, well, what about Kubernetes? Okay, well, yeah, Kubernetes is getting there. It's getting there. But here's where we went wrong. Now we start to get complex. Now we think, okay, we're engineers. Let's see what else we can do to this thing. And so we've over-engineered complexity to solve a simple problem of where Mm. can I run this workload in a consistent manner? And the common denominator is not Kubernetes. But I think that's what we're after. I think that's what we're after across the board. I think Kubernetes is very close. It's very close because... To a degree, we can make it as lightweight as we want to, but at the same time, to operate at cloud scale, to operate, you know, in in varying conditions, requ- requires various things, right? Things that, okay, if I if I'm running at the edge, I can run certain kinds of workloads. That means I have to compromise on observability, or I have to compromise on identity, or some something gets compromised at the right. edge. So. There is no common denominator, to be quite honest. I think it's Linux, <laughs> if anything. Linux, the operating system that you know for uh, has been widely used for decades, and now you know is finally the champion of all operating systems. <laughs> yeah, <sighs> except for that legacy workload that was written in Visual Basic and only runs on Windows Server two thousand three R two. Yeah, because you know oh, that's yeah. lurking somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. 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 Dependencies, dependencies. So, all right. Well, having said that, I I could go on for hours about, you know, the ways you could repatriate, why repatriate. I think it's not a full repatriation that's going on here, right? It's a partial repatriation because there is a reassessment of the unnecessary work that has gone into trying and do things that don't need to be done, like Mm. trying to microservice a monolith, for example, and then put it in the cloud. And then they begin to realize it's just cheaper to run this micro or this monolith on premises. Right. And it's predictable and it's in our control. And if we need to fix it, well, I just walk into that server room and fix it. Hmm. So, so are there people who maybe they didn't go through a lot of re-architecture. Um, they just picked it up and moved it to the cloud. Cause we, we got the lift and shift story that, and that's still gone on. Lots of people are just running things on IaaS, and they never really, refactored to be able to take advantage of cloud native services. Are they just going to move back out of the cloud and back to on premises now and kind of, kind of keep the same model or are they missing something? Should they still be rethinking how that application is deployed and getting out of the old virtualization model and be thinking, no, wait, we got to do this right now. Uh, We're going to repatriate, but I I still want to deliver a cloud-like service to my devs. If they're thinking about bringing virtual machines back on premises at this point, it's it's a real conversation to really dissect the thought process and the decisions behind why that's the case, why this is important to them. It might be cheaper to run virtual machines in the cloud. It might be cheaper to do it on premises, but the, the requirements are going to vary. And if they're looking for the same experience on premises, it could be the same. It could be different. It could be more expensive because the hardware that they had, you know, 10 years ago did certain things. Uh, they've scaled since then, and now they have to accommodate for the growth in how many workloads that they've they had to accommodate. But at the same time, right now, now they're at the mercy of working with a vendor, and they have to decide which vendor to work with. So much has changed in the landscape of hardware vendors, right? You know, Dell's still around. HPE is still kicking around. There are other vendors that have come out to play. There are network vendors that have been recently acquired, right? 
by yeah. other vendors. Yeah. So you sit there and you assess, okay, things don't look different. Things, things don't look the same. They were like 10 years ago. That landscape is different. Who are the real players that are going to offer me what I need? And here's the reality. No one's going to just sell you a switch, right? Someone's going to come out to you and sell you an entire system and a platform and tell you why you need to run it. And you'll get like 29s out of the system or platform that runs on premises. So that's the other consideration too. Um, there has been a miss, right? A lot of the efforts have been learning about the cloud, but not learning about what happened before the cloud. And so now people might be disillusioned into believing that they can run cloud-like models on premises, but forget hardware cooling, uh, sorry, uh, like heating, cooling, ventilation, AC, all that stuff, electricity, airflow. They forget about rack space. They forget about... That's not a not a nod to the actual company or anything like that. But they forget <laughs> about like things like wiring, transceivers, cable types, links. They forget right. about things like static electricity. Oh my gosh, this still exists in data centers, right? So you need a data center manager that can tell you the weight uh, per square foot and let you know that you can or can't actually rack that thing where you say you're going to rack it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I guess you know the folks that have built data centers forever are going to be like, yeah, cha-ching, let's go. <laughs> let's go on back baby i'm back let's go uh, yeah but again going back to the original model i think there's there's what, what are we saying there's efficiency that's lost if we just stick with the virtual machine model it's put very possible right our applications aren't built to align with what our virtual machines look like our applications aren't going to consume all eight gigs of memory that we feed it yeah. Right. It'll maybe consume two gigs. Um, and maybe if it's really doing something heavy at a given moment, eight gigs. But the reality is that unsustained, you know, lack of resources or that resources that sit there idly wasted. I mean, that's the reality. That's the problem. That's why we got to containers because we realized we could stack a little bit more on top, right? Mm -hmm. And be a little bit more efficient. And that's why everyone like ran to containers. But that's not the main reason you should be using Kubernetes or systems like it. I think. A big portion of that was, yeah, we had containers. That was nice. But the automations and that reconciliation cycle that runs in Kubernetes, it's just that built-in automation, you know, get, test, set, get, test, set over and over, always trying to uh, get closer to how things should be, that declarative state. And the fact that that is not baked into a lot of the other automation solutions out there. So people turn to Kubernetes and they're like, well, Man, I could just use that for anything, can't I? Even if it's way overkill for for my little project. Uh, yeah. And I think some of the work that's happened in the background is to make Kubernetes itself simpler in terms of what it's what is made up of, what makes up the bits, and how it's integrated. If all you really care about is that reconciliation cycle and the API, and you don't necessarily need all the other bells and whistles that could make up a Kubernetes deployment. Yeah, it's it's interesting because when you actually look at what what Kubernetes is under the hood, right? There's a lot of additional pieces out there to to exactly to your point, simplify how a workload will be deployed and reconciled when things go wrong. There's a lot of automation that exists today that does exactly that that isn't in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And people might gravitate to something like that because it's not a dependency on Kubernetes or upstream, right? Cluster API is an example of this, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so no real dependency on Kubernetes, but you could take a lot of that, that open source code and, and build something that is reconcilable across your workloads, across infrastructure. Um, now, you know, why this is important is that, you know, do you need Kubernetes? Do you need to layer in all this additional complexity? I think what you're going to find in the next couple of years is that there are going to be providers that come out and offer the gaps, shims, ways to kind of get around the, the unnecessary overhead to kind of help with, hey, I'm going to do this on premises. And they'll, they'll create translators. They'll create plugins. This has been going on forever. But they'll create like artificial layers that help you simulate that you're operating in the cloud give you cloud-like model on-premises, but without all the necessary or unnecessary pieces that you don't need. So you can still operate in the same way. I don't know. There's a lot of different ways this can go. 
Yeah. Yeah. Big, big switch networks had a product like that. Uh, big cloud fabric, I think is what they called it before. Arista swallowed them up. I don't know what happened to that. Oh, yeah, if it got yeah. rebundled or if it just died, but yeah, yeah I mean, there's, that was exactly that. It was like, here's an AWS like model with a lot of similar or maybe even identical primitives. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, where did that go? I'm not sure. Cause, uh, cause not long after that, Arista came along with the acquisition, but, um, Man, we're at time, we uh, Marino. But I had uh, you know one more one more point sure. to make, which follows up on what you were saying about real estate things changing, efficiency in your data center, and that are DPUs. Um, so if you haven't been in the game for a while buying servers, and you're worried about maximizing compute and RAM and utilizing those, then DPUs are part of the equation that have changed so much. We don't need to get into a big discussion, but other than I just wanted to throw that out there is that that has become a really significant thing in compute these days. Yeah, DPUs offer a way to offload some essential services. Like the classic example is, or that one that I draw on a lot is what Intel and VMware were doing a few years back with the smart NICs. Um, basically, they were offloading a lot of the NSX and and kind of like network insecurity functions to these DPU like systems or smart NICs. And effectively, it's like a computer on a NIC effectively at this point. And it's processing, doing like decryption, encryption outside of the CPU. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is like offload engines have existed for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. The classic one is the WAN, WAN, WAN optimizer. Uh, you could do this in software and then put load on your actual CPU that runs your workloads, or you can offload this to an appliance that has dedicated CPU cycles to, you know, deduplicate, compress, encrypt, and then create the tunnel across to the other side and transport your data. And that's what we're probably going to see a lot more of, like you said, right? We're going to see a lot more of that offload technology come up uh, to one, reduce overall latency between the way our applications perform and behave so we can maximize real estate available for these little workloads, either microservices or VMs. And two, um, a lot of these services living in DPUs, like the essential infrastructure-based services. Well, Marino, this has been a far-ranging and really interesting conversation. I, I We are at time, like Ethan said. If folks want to hear more from you, your thoughts on this and other things, what are the best places to find you and reach out? Honestly, just uh, Twitter, you know, or X. I don't know if we're calling it X or Twitter these days, but find me on X or Twitter and I'm there you know, out and about sharing all my thoughts about networking, cloud technologies and what's going on in this in this space. Plus, I do a bunch of other things, too. You are very active and easy to find. I can say that for certain. All right. Well, Marino, thank you so much for being a guest today on Day 2 Cloud. And hey, listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Virtual high fives to you. If you have suggestions for future shows, we would love to hear about them. You can hit us up on Twitter, Day 2 Cloud Show, or fill out the request form at packetpushers.net slash FU. The FU is for follow-up. Speaking of the website, the original Day 2 Cloud website has been retired, and the address now redirects to the Day 2 Cloud podcast page at packetpushers.net. Having a separate site for the podcast, well, it was an experiment, and the results were... Extra admin overhead, mostly for Ethan, and no real gain. So the Packet Pushers website has received a full makeover. It is gorgeous. And it also has a new jobs page. So if that sounds interesting to you, head on over to PacketPushers.net. Give it a look and let us know what you think. Until next time, just remember, cloud is what happens while IT is making other plans.